Hello and welcome to the Political History of the United States. Episode 3.1, The Glorious Revolution in Maryland. Welcome back to our third season of the podcast. When we left off last season, we had just watched the entire New England world explode as the Dominion of New England rapidly collapsed. The second season of this podcast had largely been the story of the growing pains of our still young colonies. No longer fighting to get onto their feet, the question of the colonies solidly shifted to their relationship with the greater English empire, as well as their exact rights as Englishmen inside of that empire. Now, before we go any further, I want to point out that this is going to be the standard warning for the first episode of every season of this podcast. If this is your first time listening to this show, I really do encourage you to jump back to last season's review episodes. Well, I always will encourage you to listen to the entire show. You're going to get the best bang for your buck that way. Listening to those two episodes should at least help ensure that you have some idea of what I'm talking about moving forward. This season, we are going to move the story forward all the way to the end of the French and Indian War. When we wrap up events, we are going to be sitting on the precipice of the lead-up to the American Revolution. Next season, so season four, will be the season where we get to the revolution. This season, we are going to see less turmoil than we did in our last season, at least up until the French and Indian War, of course. However, we are still going to see those questions of the rights of the colonists linger as the colonies continue to grow and develop. I think, likewise, it is going to be important to remember that during the time period that this season will cover, and generally I am talking about the latter half of the season, we are going to begin to see some of the biggest names of the revolutionary era being born. What we discuss this season is going to be the world that the founding fathers of the United States were born into. The events and development in the colonies during these decades are going to directly tie to their own worldviews. Worldviews that are going to become so critical during the founding of the United States itself. By the end of this season, we are going to start to see a handful of the founders begin to work themselves into the story. I can already tell you that we are going to spend a lot of time with Benjamin Franklin and George Washington, who will both make their first appearances this season. Just to really drive this point home, It is worth noting that Benjamin Franklin would frequently correspond with Cotton Mather during his life. So yes, we really are not that far removed at this point from the founding generation. Before we can get to that, however, we need to continue our march through the colonial era. Today, we are going to pick our story up by looking at the effects of the Glorious Revolution. Now, at the end of last season, we had obviously talked about those immediate after effects so specifically the fall of Andros in the Dominion and Leisler's Rebellion. However, this season I'm going to broaden that story and look at how the Glorious Revolution changed the colonies overall. Today, we are going to spend our time looking specifically at events outside of New England and see how the other colonies dealt with what was undeniably a huge and ground-shifting event. Today, we are going to move to the South, and look at how the collapse of the Dominion would affect the Chesapeake colonies. And really, for today, that means we are going to specifically focus on the events that took place in Maryland. While the overthrow of the Dominion government was most acutely felt up in the north, the south would see repercussions as well. Following the end of Bacon's Rebellion, there had been a sharp increase in the amount of royal governance inside of Virginia and Maryland. A series of factors had led to economic hardships, and this was still being felt when the Glorious Revolution hit England. Virginia, for example, was still struggling under the Navigation Acts and their restrictions upon tobacco. This, combined with Bacon's Rebellion and the now strict production quotas enforced by royal troops, had led the colonists to burning their crops in a desperate bid to reduce the supply of tobacco and hence drive up the prices. Maryland has been in our story for a while now often as something of a fringe player to the events going on in Virginia. Recall that during Bacon's Rebellion, Maryland itself was dealing with many of the same pressures that caused the uprising in Virginia. In fact, during that brief moment, when separation from the crown was being toyed with in Virginia, they looked to their neighbors over in Maryland as a potential ally. The call was going to be for the separation of not just Virginia, but rather the entire Chesapeake. 
The Sources of Tension in Maryland is actually a pretty nice conglomeration of those stresses that we see both north in New England as well as south in Virginia. Like in New England, religion had become a problem for the colony. Originally founded as a kind of Catholic haven in North America, Maryland had always struggled to get that Catholic presence. Despite that, however, Cecil Calvert, the second Lord Baltimore, like his father, was an outspoken Catholic. Still clutching to the idea that Maryland was some kind of a Catholic refuge, all of the major positions on the Colonial Council went to the colony's Catholics. The problem with this was is that Maryland really was not a Catholic colony in reality, with the vast majority of the population being made up of Anglicans. While the governor and the council remained firmly Catholic bodies, the representative assembly was just that, representative. That means that the assembly was largely Protestant, facing off against the Catholic executive. Like their close neighbors to the south, Maryland also had to deal with an increasingly depressed economic situation on top of all of this. As mentioned a moment ago, Maryland was subject to all the same hardships that they felt down in Virginia. The Navigation Acts had done a lot to depress the price of tobacco. It was the farmers who really felt the pain from these cuts, as suddenly it had become much harder to survive at a subsistence level. What you end up with, therefore, is a colony that, in the midst of an economic depression, is being controlled from a group that in no way meaningfully represents the colonial majority. The first clash came in 1669, when it was suggested that, in order to better reflect the will of the people, that the colony become a more representative body. This would lead to a listing of grievances being filed regarding the increasingly arbitrary actions of the chief proprietor and the council. Unamused by this development, rather than conceding to the necessity for at least minor reform, the proprietors decided to dig in their heels and further restrict the vote, changing it from all the freemen to all the freeholders. This change meant that the tenant farmers, who made up a significant portion of the population, now lacked a say entirely. This is to say nothing of the constant attacks on the borders by the local Indian tribes. Recall that during the lead-up to Bacon's Rebellion in Virginia, there was a whole lot of finger-pointing between the Virginia and the Maryland militias as to who had actually led to the slaughter of the Susquehannock people. So to quickly sum up the situation in Maryland, they had all of the economic troubles and concerns over Native affairs on their borders as did Virginia, with a nice bit of the religious strife of New England mixed in for good measure. Following the events of Bacon's Rebellion, where we saw Maryland throwing around their own declarations, we do see things calm down until the 1680s and the Exclusion Crisis. For the colonists in Maryland, the Exclusion Crisis took on a very different look than it did up in England. Becoming more pronounced during the Popish plots and then really getting hammered home during the attempt to exclude James II from the crown, there was increasing anti-Catholicism spreading throughout England. In a place like Maryland where, nominally at least, it is a Catholic colony, this sudden increase in anti-Catholic sentiments was a disturbing development for the proprietors. The problem for them is pretty obvious. Despite their continuous statements that they were indeed a Catholic colony, it was lost on absolutely nobody that the numbers didn't actually support the fact that Maryland was, you know, a Catholic colony. Increasing anti-Catholic feelings put the entire government of Maryland into an increasing amount of danger. And to be clear, the Maryland government really did have something to worry about. By having an Anglican population, a population that was not the same religion as the executive, there would have been few tears shed should that executive have been overthrown. Despite increasing frustrations throughout the early 1680s, Baltimore and the other proprietors failed to make even a single concession to the Protestant majority. In 1682, with tobacco being burnt in Virginia, back in Maryland, the Protestants demanded that their rights as Englishmen be respected. To which, Baltimore replied by reminding them that he is the boss, and that was that. Once again, we see the question of the rights of Englishmen arise within the colonies. Baltimore, not interested in a diplomatic move, made clear that they had none, there are no rights, that they had given those up when they left the home islands. Baltimore at this point was being attacked from all sides, as he was now also dealing with attacks 
from William Penn regarding the borders, a fight that Penn is ultimately going to win. This was something that we had discussed back in episode 2.20. It is also important to note that James II was no friend of Baltimore's. Well, on the surface, they seem like natural allies, seeing as they are both Catholics, this really was not the case. Well, religiously, the two men were aligned with each other, James II was also interested in getting rid of proprietary government and installing royal governments throughout the colonies. Following the exclusion crisis, the name of the game had become reasserting royal power throughout the entire English system. Proprietary governments worked against that end and, in the eyes of the king, gave far too much power to individuals. James II wanted nice, efficient administrations of the colonies, and the best way to accomplish that end was through the use of royal colonial governments. Tensions continued to rise following Baltimore's appointment of the Irish Catholic William Joseph as governor of the colony. Upon his arrival, Joseph brought with him a decree from England that only high-quality tobacco could be exported. The hope back in England is that by exporting only high-quality tobacco, it would help to drive up the demand. However, for the colonists in Maryland that had become dependent on producing cheaper bulk tobacco, this was another devastating blow to the economy. By the latter half of the 1680s, the economic situation in the colonies was becoming untenable right as grievances against the colonial government were beginning to mount. During the latter half of the 1680s, the proprietors in Maryland did have reason to be worried. It's not theoretical that, hey, James II might come for us because James II was indeed coming for them. In April of 1687, the king did order that a quo oranto be drafted against the Maryland Charter, the second such quo oranto of the decade. For James, the move made complete sense. He wanted to transition Maryland to a royal government. And by this time in Maryland itself, Baltimore was having an increasingly difficult time controlling the angry rabble. From the king's perspective, if Baltimore was not going to prevent a rebellion in the colony, what purpose did he still have to the crown? The quo waranto failed to gain much traction, as James II was completely consumed with other events by the time the document was ready during the summer of 1688. By the time of April 1689, the proprietors were doing their best to maintain control over an increasingly angry populace. Now, if you had listened to this show at all last season, you know that nothing in the colonies is going to become more stable during April of 1689. Right at the moment when news of the Glorious Revolution began to roll into Maryland, the colony was under attack both internally from the Protestant majority as well as in England by a king determined to do away with proprietary rule. In the weeks before news of the Glorious Revolution began pouring into the colonies, rumors of James II's overthrow did begin to gain traction. The government of Maryland was rightfully worried about these rumors, and had decided to act upon that note that James II had sent the previous year, that note about a potential Dutch invasion coming. The government ordered that all the guns in the colonies be brought in for inspection, you know, to make sure they are in tip-top shape. However, the real plan of the colonial government was to ensure that an angry Protestant population got no crazy ideas of dispatching with the Catholic proprietors. Initially, at least, this would help an uneasy peace survive in the colony. Much as was the case in New England, the spring of 1689 was a rumor-filled time. There were rumors over James II being ousted and often executed, and those poured into the colony. However, like everywhere else, little actual news found its way into Maryland. Increasingly concerned over these rumors, the decision was made by the council to delay the assembly from meeting in the April session. In the midst of all the confusion, we know that Baltimore made a critical error in delaying the Declaration of Allegiance to William and Mary. Credible news had reached Virginia by March of 1689, and they quickly did declare for their new monarchs. So it is a little bit questionable why Baltimore delayed in making such a declaration himself. This delay did nothing but help stroke the flames of suspicion that had already been flaring up in the colony for years. With Baltimore suddenly looking a lot more vulnerable, it was under John Coode that an association of arms for the defense of the Protestant religion was formed in Maryland. 
like 1689, Kood had a long and storied history of being opposed to, and subsequently in the crosshairs of, Lord Baltimore. Kood, at one point during the early 1680s, during the exclusion crisis, found himself arrested for treason, though he was eventually acquitted. All the meanwhile, Baltimore still continued to hold off from making any kind of official proclamation of his allegiance to the new king and queen. I have seen a few potential explanations for the delay, including that Baltimore may have been waiting to hear whether or not Parliament was going to recognize William and Mary. However, beyond speculation, there is little actual evidence to explain why Lord Baltimore was taking his sweet time about things. By the time that July had rolled around, Baltimore still had made no formal recognition of the new monarchs. Now, despite all this, it is interesting to note that the proprietors actually had done a pretty good job of keeping the information of what was going on up in New England and New York out of the colony. The evidence suggests that the colonists really were pretty unaware of the revolts that spring that had swept through the former Dominion holdings. By the middle of July 1689, the Protestants were more than ready to declare their allegiance to William and Mary, regardless of what their proprietor wanted to do. On July 16th, Coote along with his followers marched on St. Mary, the then capital of Maryland. Much like with the information regarding why Baltimore wouldn't just pledge himself to William and Mary, evidence as to why July 16th was the date that it all boiled over is likewise lost to history. It is possible that they were motivated by news that Colonel William Diggs was working towards fortifying government buildings for a possible Protestant insurrection. If this is true, Coote and his men may have decided that if they were going to ever strike, this was their moment. Wait any longer and the government forces would be able to better protect themselves and ultimately making any such move would become impossible. Either way, on July 16th, 1689, Coot and company made their move and marched on St. Mary's. During the march to the capital, Coot saw his numbers grow to several hundred. Arriving at the State House, it briefly appeared that Coot's men were going to attack the men under the command of Diggs. However, Diggs' men saw the approaching army and decided that they were just not that interested in a fight. With his men unwilling to fight, Diggs was forced to surrender. Other plans to rally a counterforce to oppose Coot fizzled out as well. Kood, playing things intelligently here and trying to keep a widespread outbreak of violence from occurring, reassured everybody that he had no plans to topple the government, but rather his mission was for the noble cause of proclaiming William and Mary. Regardless of how transparently obvious it was to the old government that Kood had more in mind, they were basically forced to just go with what he said. And this is unsurprising because, you know, the Protestants did hold a four-fifths majority of the population by 1689. The government did not have enough men to do much of anything about Coode or his followers. They were badly outnumbered and they knew it. Baltimore's men did make some feeble attempts to regain control over the situation. They offered to name Henry Giles as the commander of the colonial troops as a method of trying to regain the allegiance of the men now under Coode's control, in the hope that Giles would prove a more popular figure. This, however, would prove to be a serious miscalculation when Giles not only declined the offer, but then went on to become the second in command of the men under the control of Coode. So, yeah, that's obviously not great. The deputies then made yet another baffling decision when they offered a full pardon to anybody willing to put down their arms. Now, we have seen this come up a few times now throughout the course of the show. However, the difference here is that normally when we have seen a mass pardon handed out, it is in an attempt to get men to abandon an army that is on the ropes. In other words, the men would see that the cause was totally hopeless and that they were going to lose, and the pardon was now their best chance to survive and save their lives. The problem in Maryland is that when the offer was made, Coot's men were not losing by any stretch of the imagination. There was exactly zero incentive to accept the offer. Despite his earlier statements to the limited nature of his actions, Coot very much understood that he now controlled the situation entirely. Knowing this, Kud did a masterful job of continuing to stroke the fires of anger within his men. With anger now reaching a fever pitch, his men moved on. They borrowed, or more realistically stole, a couple large guns from the ships in the harbor, and then proceeded to lay siege to the governor's mansion in nearby Mattapani 
where most of the deputies had relocated following the fall of St. Mary's. Realizing that the situation was hopeless, the deputies did agree to negotiate. Agreed to on August 1, 1689, the terms of the surrender were sweeping. Beyond the obvious provision that Kuzmin would be allowed to return home unmolested, Kud went for more broad sweeping changes. The biggest change was that the Catholics in Maryland would be barred from all civil and military offices. This is an absolutely stunning move in that it was going to essentially purge out the entire executive government and would effectively end the colony's time as being a nominal Catholic colony. Of course, pragmatically speaking, nothing was surprising about this turn of events. We have talked at length today that the colony's population was a vast Protestant majority who were anxious to purge out the minority Catholics, as was the style at the time, and making dissecting all of this a bit easier, between July 16th and the August 1st surrender, Kud and his men had the chance to justify their actions in the form of a written document, titled The Declaration of the Reasons and Motives for the Present Appearing in Arms of Their Majesty's Protestant Subjects in the Province of Maryland. The attack in the declaration was in many ways predictable. The declaration spends a significant amount of time complaining about the Catholics in the colony, with the Glorious Revolution being based largely on the fears of James II launching a Catholic dynasty in England and Maryland being a Catholic colony, it was a logical place to attack. They pointed out that their governor was an Irish papist. After setting this up nicely, they point out that there hasn't been the slightest hint that the colony was going to declare for William and Mary anytime soon. Smartly, the rebels would write the following. Allegiance here by these persons under whom we suffer is little talked of, other than what they would have done and sworn to his lordship, the lord proprietor, for it was lately owned by the president himself, openly enough in the upper house of the assembly, that fealty to his lordships was allegiance, and that the denial of the one was the same thing with the refusal or denial of the other, in that very oath of fealty that was then imposed under the penalty and threats of banishment, there is not so much as the least word of intimation of any duty, faith, or allegiance to be reserved to our sovereign lord, the King of England. This is actually a pretty great move on their part. The paragraph does two primary things that would have gotten William and Mary's attention. First, it makes clear that the fealty in the colony was not to the king or the government of England. The last line of the passage makes clear that there is no talk of pledging allegiance to the monarchy. Rather, allegiance in Maryland goes directly to Lord Baltimore. William and Mary were still at the very beginning of their reign, one that started with rebellion just months before. A rebellion against the Catholic King James II. The colonists here do a good job of channeling all of those concerns into a single paragraph. They illustrate that the real power in Maryland lies not with the crown, but with Lord Baltimore, who was at that very moment resisting the new monarchs. Beyond these calls that Baltimore is more or less a threat to the new king and queen's own power, the document does delve more specifically into the common themes that we have seen throughout the colonies over the past decade and a half, namely accusations of arbitrary rule. There are some mentions as well of persecution of Protestants by Catholics, in the fashion of illegal imprisonment. If you read the entire document going on, it does also, for good measure, include warnings of French aggression, and mind you, England just began a war with France, including insinuations that Baltimore might actually be complicit in such a conflict, or even possibly actively aiding the French. The Declaration of Reasons and Motives, much like the Declaration of the Gentlemen from earlier in the year, justified the actions of the colonists by turning to the glorious revolution itself and framing their actions as being in the interest of the new king. Sure, things had been terrible in Maryland for years. However, overthrowing the government, that was necessary now because Baltimore and his deputies were antithetical to what William and Mary stood for. Not only did it provide a convenient justification, but it meant that saying otherwise would have potentially painted the new king in a bad light himself as such an outcry over the move would have seemed to be hypocritical on the part of the monarch. It is worth noting as well here that despite the events going on up in the north, in the former dominion of New England, Coote and his men again don't really appear to be aware of what had happened there. 
I mention this because it is important to keep this in mind when looking at the greater overall picture of the colonies at the beginning of the 1690s. This is further evidence against the argument of some greater unified fight for independence during the era, and rather supports the position that the colonies are still very much divided in separate entities. The evidence suggests, therefore, that the reaction to the Glorious Revolution was not some grand unifying event in the colonies, but rather was a pragmatic response to the individual grievances of each separate entity. Ultimately, the hoped result of rebellion would be realized. However, that would not come until 1691. In August of that year, Baltimore saw his rights to Maryland stripped. The colony was given a royal governor and operated essentially like New York. In this fashion, the events of Coode's rebellion would prove to be successful. He achieved his objective. Baltimore was gone, and the colony was no longer to be dominated by a Catholic minority. For William and Mary, the events by Coode provided a convenient excuse to consolidate colonial power in North America and continue what had been a prevailing trend since the time of Charles II, which was doing away with the proprietary colonies. Thus far in our exploration of the Glorious Revolution, we have seen rebellions throughout all of New England. We have seen Jacob Leisler seize power in New York. And then, of course, today we spent our time in Maryland. Well, this does give a picture of uprisings that spread throughout the entire colonial structure of North America. And that really isn't true. In fact, the rebellions that we have talked about are all that there really were. Well, confusion and rumors, understandably, spread throughout all of the colonies. We fail to see any other organized resistance, either for or against agents of the English government. Beyond a sense of uncertainty, there was little in the way of reaction either in the Carolinas or in Pennsylvania. In Virginia, there was likewise no reaction, which is a bit more surprising on its surface. Virginia continued to deal with a faltering economy, and the English had not done much to endear themselves to Virginians during Bacon's Rebellion. On its face, Virginia had a lot of reasons to want to rise up as it happened in New England, New York, and Maryland, and take advantage of the opportunity. So why didn't they? Well, it is impossible to state why a greater rebellion failed to form in Virginia. It is theorized that the reason may simply be that following Bacon's rebellion and the resulting fallout, there simply was not a fight in the colonists at that time. Unlike in the other colonies, an exhausted populace in Virginia dealt with the news with more of a shrug than an invitation to arms. Regardless of the reason, Virginia accepted the change with little in the way of any reaction. All throughout the North American colonies, we have seen the often rapid effects of the Glorious Revolution. Governments in New England, New York, and now Maryland have been toppled. There was a period where the colonists scored victory after victory. In New England, the Dominion took just 48 hours to come crashing down following the events in Boston. Edmund Andros was captured and arrested. In New York, Jacob Leisler would act as governor until the situation got away from him and he found himself being executed. And now in Maryland, Coode and his band of Protestants had successfully overthrown Lord Baltimore and ended the Catholic-dominated government. Interestingly enough is the fact that none of these rebellions turn out to be particularly bloody, largely due to the overwhelming majority in terms of numbers. This wave of rebellions that would sweep through the colonies in 1689 are all virtually bloodless. There is a lot of rabble, certainly. However, events never progress towards anything resembling actual battles. The soon-to-be-disposed governors quickly realized that they were so seriously outnumbered that fighting back would have been akin to a suicide mission with little being gained. In the case of Francis Nicholson in New York, he literally looked at the situation and just pretty much noped out, hopping on a ship and making his way straight back to England. In any event, within just a few months of the Boston Uprising, dramatic changes had come throughout the North American English colonies. In the aftermath, new questions would arrive that are going to help determine the next phase of events in the colonies. Maryland, New York, and all of the New England colonies had just overthrown their governments and, in the aftermath of 1689, were now drifting through uncharted waters as they existed without royal authority. This is to say nothing of the underlying question of the rights of the colonists as Englishmen in the colonies, 
a question that is going to paint the future of relations between the English back at home and the colonists in North America. Next time, we are going to look at the longer-term effects of the rebellions that would sweep through the colonies during the Glorious Revolution. It is now up to William and Mary to decide how to best regain meaningful control over their colonies and how to better consolidate their own rule throughout the English Dominion. With that, I hope you all have a wonderful two weeks. I hope you are staying healthy and staying safe. And I will see you back here in two weeks' time as we begin to examine the long-term ramifications of the Glorious Revolution in the Colonies. <laughs>